six. So, um, and we've got about 1,500 years to cover in 90 minutes over two weeks. So let's get started. Um, and anybody who pops in, we'll, we'll let them pop in as they can. Um, so we are, uh, we are going to talk about Celtic Christian spirituality uh, for the next couple weeks here. Um, as many of you are probably aware, we are taking a pilgrimage to Ireland in October, for those who are interested. And so there's, uh, there are three handouts in the back. Uh, one of them is about uh, Celtic spirituality, and it covers things different from what I'm going to talk about in the next couple weeks. Uh, one of them is about the trip itself, and there's a third that is also informational. I forget what that is. Um, but feel free to grab those. Uh, it'll, it'll fill you in a little bit about the trip and uh, give you some information. But so as we're talking about uh, Celtic spirituality, I, as I thought about this, I tried to think, yeah, what, okay, so what can we do in 90 minutes? Um, and the answer is not much. We're going to have to go real fast. Uh, but um, so as we, as we look at this together, oh, all right, let's see here. Um, as we look at this together, we will move to this slide. There we go. Um, so, does this guy work for me? All right, here's our plan. Uh, week one, we're going to talk about who the Celts are. Um, this is, I think, a foundation for the notion of Celtic sp spirituality is this word Celtic. Um, what, is it, what does Celtic mean? And you probably have an idea in your mind, but my, my guess is if we were to um, all try to define it, uh, we would have almost as many different definitions as people in this room. And it turns out it's actually a really slippery term. So we're going to start out by talking about who the Celts are, and then we're going to try to name one. Um, and then uh, week two, we're going to move, and you all know me by now, we're talking about art. Um, right? So week two, we'll talk about art and some sacred objects. So uh, this week, we're going to focus primarily on, on that. the first bit, uh, who are the Celts, and then we'll move to the art and the objects. So with, uh, with this notion, who are the Celts, um, it's, it's a lot trickier than it sounds. Um, so much so, we're going to spend most of our time today on this question. Uh, trying to answer who are the Celts, it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like trying to answer who is, who is a Pittsburgher. Um, what does it mean to be uh, from Pittsburgh? Do, do you have to be born here? Uh, and if so, where is here? How far north? Can you be born in Wexford and be a Pittsburgher? Uh, what about Erie? Or what if you're not born in, what about Dylan? My son Dylan uh, was born in Orlando, lived there for about mm, 11 months, and then moved to Pittsburgh and has been here the rest of his life. Is Dylan a Pittsburgher? Do you have to like the Steelers? <laughs> yes, is the answer to that question. But if you were born in Pittsburgh and you like the Steelers, but you move to San Francisco, and after 20 years of watching Steelers games in San Francisco, are you still a Pittsburgher? Yes. yes? <laughs> uh, do you need to say yins? Do you need to say don? Uh, right? right? So there are all these questions. Is it, is, it, is it about your birth? Is it about culture? Is it about language? Is it about residence? Same things apply to this notion of the Celts. Are you going to define this group by birthplace? Are you going to define it by language? Do you define it by religion? Do you define it by nationality? Do you define it by culture? And so for me, when I bump up against questions like this, I, I want to, to go back and look at the history. And so let's, let's do a little bit of looking at history. And let's, let's do this. Uh, for our time together, this week and some next week, let's see if we can situate this, this notion of, of Celtic alongside the history that we have in our minds. Does anybody have a pretty good history of, of Celts in your mind? Yeah, probably not. Um, right, we, we, the, the histories that we have as Pittsburghers, uh, Presbyterians, uh, we've got scriptural history, we've got some, some Western history, and so let's, let's see if we can figure out how Celtic history uh, intertwines or intersects or doesn't with the histories that we know. So let's start with the history that we know. Let's do a timeline. Now, we are Christians, so let's put Jesus in the middle. Um, we'll put Jesus right here in the center of our timeline, and we'll go about 2,000 years before Jesus uh, to Abraham. All right, so Abraham's going to be back here about... Now, these, let's, let's do this, too. As we talk about dates and names and people, 
we do not have a valid U.S. government-issued birth certificate for Abraham. So we don't know exactly when he was born. So all these dates, they're going to be approximate. Right? So Abraham is roughly 2,000 years uh, before Jesus, which on the other side of that is us, right? Uh, just uh, roughly 2,000 years after Jesus. And so as we look at this story, we know biblical history. We go from Abraham to his son Isaac to his kid Jacob, who we're going to talk about in worship this morning. Uh, they then go, um, they go into Egypt, and that doesn't go very well. They leave Egypt. Moses takes them out. Joshua takes them to a new land. They get some judges. They really want a king. And then after about a thousand years, we get David. Right? So uh, about a thousand years pass between Abraham and David, and it is 1010, and I have done a thousand years. That's pretty good for me. <laughs> All right. So uh, King David is about a thousand years in between uh, Abraham and Jesus. And as we continue the story of, of biblical history, uh, David is the king, then his son Solomon does a great job until he kind of doesn't. And then there's a civil war, the kingdom splits, and some other nations come in, and uh, we end up with the prophets, prophets like Ezekiel. And so Ezekiel shows up around, around 600, and so this is 600 before Jesus. And so typically scholars now will use, they use uh, CE and uh, BCE instead of uh, AD and BC. But we are literally talking about before Jesus. Um, this is, Jesus is literally in the center of our timeline here. So we'll, we can say BC. Right? So 600 before Christ, uh, we get Ezekiel. And so uh, as Ezekiel is uh, the, the prophet, the people have been taken out of Israel, and they've been taken into exile in Babylon. So this is the map. We've seen maps like this before in our time together here. But so uh, Israel is over here, Jerusalem is here, and the people have been taken from here uh, over uh, into the, the capital over this direction. And so the people of Israel have moved east. And this is what's happening around 600. And this is where you get... Ezekiel, you get Jeremiah, you get people like Daniel. So this is where we are in our Bible history. Are you with me in your Bible history here? All right, now, um, you may at this point be saying to yourself, this is all well and good, but I thought we were talking about Celtic spirituality. Be patient with me. Um, so around 600, this is what's happening down here. But there are some other things moving up north. And so let's look at a map of what's happening up north. There's a people group that's coming from Western Asia, Eastern Europe, and nobody knows what to call them. Around 600, uh, archaeologists have found these inscriptions. And it's in a language. Uh, it's in 600. We don't know what to call them yet. That's coming soon. We have a name for them now. But we have this inscription, and it's not, it's not Greek. It's not Latin, it's not Hebrew, it's not Babylonian, it's a completely different language family. So this other linguistic family, we get these inscriptions, and they're kind of all over this area, and the people who speak this language are coming from the east and headed west. Now, what were the Jews doing at this time? Remember, we just talked about it. They were in the west, and they were headed east. And this people group is in the east, and they're heading west. And so they're, they're like trains passing in the night, uh, but they're on, they're on parallel tracks. So while the Jews are going from west to east, this other people group is going from east to west. And their tracks don't, they're parallel. They don't really bump into each other. And so as our attention in scripture shifts east, this other group shifts west. Now, let's go back into our timeline here. As this is all happening, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Daniel. Um, then we get to another really important Bible story, Esther. So Esther, Esther is a wonderful Bible story, all about a, a Hebrew woman who ends up becoming um, a Persian queen. And if you read the book of Esther, it is a fabulous book. And there's this sort of um, supporting character who is Esther's husband. And through the book, he's pretty much just Esther's husband. In the book of Esther, this is Esther's husband. In the rest of world history, he's known as Emperor Xerxes. But in Esther, he's Esther's husband. And so what Xerxes does 
Um, this, is a, a, this is a John Martin depiction of Esther. We see her here. Uh, this is Haman, that uh, vile character who tried to exterminate the Jews. And we get um, Esther's husband, Xerxes, over here. And if you remember, uh, Haman was trying to get rid of the Jews who had been brought over into Persia. And Xerxes is not paying a whole lot of attention. He signed some papers he shouldn't sign. Esther eventually goes in to, to her husband and says, the person who's trying to kill me is Haman. And so then Xerxes decides to eliminate Haman. Right, this is the story of Esther. And so as all this is happening, um, this is what Xerxes conquers. Uh, Esther's husband takes over all of this. And so uh, he expands that um, Babylonian empire, which was kind of like right here. And he takes it all the way uh, to the east goes even up into uh, the northwest. But you'll notice there's something kind of important right over here. This is a little area known as Greece. He couldn't, he couldn't get Greece. Um, Xerxes, Esther's husband, is the one who tried to go over and conquer Greece, and he bumped into another famous historical figure known as Leonidas, who uh, led the, the Battle of the 300. We, we love this story in the United States. We've made movies and video games and comic books about it. So Xerxes, he kept trying to expand further west and north, and he was stopped cold. He wasn't able to get any further. And so again, let's remember, um, oh, well, OK, we'll go back to this first. Um, what's happening here, uh, because Xerxes can't get any further, who knows who this is? This is Socrates. Because Xerxes gets stopped, uh, Greece is safe from Persian influence which allows Greek culture to thrive. And a few years after uh, Xerxes, we get the birth, life, and death of Socrates. Now, Socrates is kind of a big deal, mostly because of his student, whose name is Plato. Plato, right? Most of what we know about Socrates comes from Plato. So Plato writes all these books that we still study in philosophy uh, classes today. I was a philosophy major. I read lots of that stuff. Um, right, so Socrates teaches Plato, and Greece is safe because, uh, because the uh, 300 are able to defeat Xerxes. Um, so he dies around, around 400, right? So a couple generations after Xerxes, we get Socrates. And so let's, uh, eh, no, okay. Um, that's what's happening in Greece. But if you would go further west, you would find Italy. Xerxes also does not get to Italy, right? It's even further west. And in Italy, there's this little town. It's kind of an up-and-coming place you may have heard of. It's called Rome. Now, at this point, right, 399, Rome is not a major city. It's not a major uh, seat of an empire. It is an up-and-coming town. And uh, as the Romans are over here, um, that group of people, remember who we said were moving west, they've gotten into northern Italy. And as they've done this, they bumped into the Greeks along the way. And so this nameless group of people who have a different language, as the Greeks encountered them, they wrote about this, their encounters, and they called this group of people the Keltoi. The Greek word is, it's, it's, look, in English, it's K-E-L-T-O-I. In Greek, O-I is plural, so they are the Celts. And so we now have a name for this group of people with their different language. The Celts have been moving west. And as the Greeks bumped into them, mostly because of people like Socrates and Plato, the Greeks, their culture is reaching its, its apex. Right? The Greeks are feeling really good about their culture, really good about their contributions to history and medicine and art and philosophy. And so they see these Celts, and they look at them as pretty primitive. And they even describe them almost as barbarians. They're not. But they keep moving west until they get to Italy. And as they get to Italy, they now bump into the Romans. The Romans don't speak Greek. The Romans speak Latin. And so they don't call them Celts. They, they use a word in Latin, and it's, it's more like Gauls. And so the Romans call these people Gauls. Now, if you know much about history, you may have the word Gaul connected with a specific nation. Does anybody have the word Gaul connected with a nation? France. France. Thank you. We think of Gaul as France. Not yet. That's going to happen in a little while, which is part of where the, the, the confusion with the term Celtic starts to appear, because the Romans call them Gauls, but Gaul also ends up being one specific nation. So when we think of Gauls in history, all Gauls are, are Celts, but not all Celts 
are Gauls, but right now they're all the same. So we'll get to that distinction in a little bit. For right now, the Gauls, the, the, uh, the Romans have bumped into the Gauls, and they don't much care for them. And uh, Rome is down here. And there's this uh, little skirmish where someone from a border town in Rome kills a Gaul. And the Gauls are not, they're not real happy about that. So the Gauls send, uh, send a, a little dispatch into Roman territory to go to the city where the murderer is, and they ask, essentially, for extradition. They say, one of yours killed one of ours. Send, the, send him and his accomplices over to us so we can punish them. And the Romans said, absolutely not. Um, the, the, these, are, these are Romans. Uh, they are under our laws, not yours, and you all kind of freak us out. So you stay up there, and we'll deal with our own down here. And so the Gauls, when they heard that response, they weren't real happy about that either. And so one of the Gauls, or Celts, this guy named Brennus, B-R-E-N-N-U-S, around 390. Right, so this is right around the same time as Socrates. And Brennus gathers a, an army of Celts, and they march into Roman territory. They march into Roman territory, and they, they attack the Roman city that's harboring these murderers. Now, the Romans at this point, their, their military is it's pretty professional. It's pretty polished. They've got a lot of serious armor and shields and rank and file, and they hear that the Celts are coming. So the Romans send out their soldiers. They come up with a battle plan. And it's orderly, and it's organized, and it's systematic, and it's beautiful. And as the uh, Roman army is there, they, they, they send the, the largest part, the most experienced part of their force, right in the center of the battlefield, and they take the reserves and push them off to the side so that they can then uh, collide with the Celts, and the reserves can flank them, and now they're going to defeat the Celts pretty easily. So the Romans are ready. They've got their armor on, and they look to the hills to see the Celts coming, and when the Celtic army comes over the horizon, it does not look like the Roman army. As the Romans look at these Gauls, these Celts, they don't have fancy helmets. They don't have fancy shields. They don't have fancy breastplates. I mean, there's, there's really no two ways to describe it. They are naked. The Celtic warriors fight in only the armor that God has given them. <laughs> and so the Celtic warriors come over the horizon completely naked. Now, not all of them are naked. Uh, some of the commanders have some, some armor on. But for the most part, the Celtic warriors, they're naked. And they're, they're, are, it's not just by accident. And it's, it's not because they're barbarians. Now, the Romans look at this, and they see naked soldiers coming over the horizon. And they look, and they, they, the Celts, they also wear their hair very long. Uh, look, at, look at Brennus. And they also have, they have long facial hair. And I, don't, I haven't dug into this a whole lot. All of the descriptions I found say, in particular, it was mustaches. I don't know if it was, uh, but even in the pictures, they got mustaches. Right? So uh, the, these, these Celtic warriors, naked, with long hair and long mustaches, come over the horizon. And the Romans look at this, and their shiny armor, their fancy shields, and their pretty hats. And the Romans say, these are animals. Right? Look at these barbarians. These are wild animals. We're going to put them down like wild animals. This is not going to take long. And they're right. It doesn't take long. But it doesn't go the way they expect. Because they're, the Celts are not barbarians. The Celts are brilliant. And as they come over that horizon, completely naked, Brennus looks at the Romans with all their fancy little organization, and he can see exactly what they're doing. Brennus knows what they're doing as he comes over the horizon. He divides his troops a kind of an opposite way where he ends up having, um, he, he evens out uh, the entire line, so he doesn't have the best troops concentrated anywhere, and he pushes the majority of his troops not toward the center where the Romans are most, uh, most advanced and most powerful, he pushes over against the reserves. So he leaves his reserves evened out with some strength to, to hold the Romans back. His main force destroys the Roman reserves who are ill-prepared, and then they surround the remaining Romans. 
The Romans did not expect this to happen. They turn around and run. But what's behind them is a river. So they run, they've got Celts to dodge as they get to the river, and as they try to, to swim across the river, remember what the Celts are wearing? Nothing. <laughs> remember what the Romans are wearing? <laughs> Armor. When they all jump into the river, who sinks first? <laughs> so the Romans, they get obliterated in this battle against the Celts. And the Celts, they win so quickly and so easily and so unexpectedly, they look at one another and say, well, you guys want to get lunch? <laughs> what, what do we do now? And so, well, yeah, let's get lunch. Where, where should we go? I don't know. They say there's a bigger city a little south of here. What was it called again? Rome. And so the Gauls, the Celtic warriors, completely naked, march on from this city to Rome. And something we don't talk about, remember, we like to talk about how the Greeks fought off the Persians. We don't tell this story in American history classes. The Celts marched on Rome, and they took it. The Celts overthrew and burned Rome in about 390. And this was not, this was not their plan. Right? They just wanted to get the murderers extradited. And they ended up conquering Rome. So now they're occupying Rome. And they look at one another and say, well, now we finish lunch. What do we do? And th this is, we're getting into such deep history. There are different versions of this story, and it's hard to tell which one is true. Uh, according to one of them, Grannis just held Rome until he died. Um, more, more scholars say that what happened is that the Celts didn't plan to occupy it, didn't send enough troops to occupy it. They held on for several months, and finally the Romans said, look, will you please leave? And the Celts said, why should we leave? And the Romans said, how much do we have to pay you to leave? And the Celts sat down, and they thought up the biggest sum they could think of, and the Romans then paid the Celts to go back north. And the Celts then eventually um, went back north to what we know as Gaul, leaving the Romans their own territory again. Whatever happened, we do know that the, the Romans ended up with their territory once again, and the Celts probably regretted that. So, um, there's our, our story about Brennus, the uh, Celtic conqueror who actually took over Rome, but back to what's happening in the rest of the world. Right, so Rome is way over here. Um, this is right, Persian reign. Uh, Greece is over here. And um, uh, about this point, uh, remember we had Socrates who, who teaches his student Plato. Well, Plato decides he's going to take on a student, uh, a man named Aristotle. Aristotle takes on his own student, who's named Alexander. And so while the Romans are busy fighting the Celts and the Persians are busy being Persians, a guy named Alexander is born in Greece. And Alexander, uh, in the 300s, Alexander turns this into this. This is Alexander's empire. And look over here. I mean, he started in Greece. He had it to begin with. Right, so Alexander's got Greece, and he sweeps over here. He doesn't really take this desert. It's just a desert. Um, right, so he takes all these other territories. And so now Alexander has spread uh, to the west. Alexander has his own empire, while the Romans are just this little up-and-coming town back over here. Now, that all works out just fine until this guy. This is Julius Caesar. Now, let's go back to our map. Uh, Caesar is in Rome, and this territory, Gaul, the Romans have lived in perpetual fear of the Celts. Ever since the Celts invaded them naked, uh, destroyed their armies, and burned their city. <laughs> uh, who knew that that's enough to make you a boogeyman? Right? So the Celts are, are the fear of the Roman Empire. And so Julius Caesar, as Rome becomes a republic, they send this, this general named Caesar to head into Gaul around 100. And so uh, Caesar is going to head into, so Italy is over here. He's going to head up into this area, which is sometimes called Gaul, but this map calls it Celtica. Right? This uses the more Greek name. And Caesar, he writes a lot about his battles in Gaul. And he says, these Gauls, they've got a name for themselves. They call themselves Celts. 
because they don't speak Latin, they aren't enlightened. If they were enlightened, they would know they're actually gods. <laughs> oh, Caesar. Um, now, uh, the, the, which is, Caesar's testimony there is, is kind of significant. Some scholars have used that to say that this word, Celt, it's actually not a Greek word. It may be a Celtic word. I mean, this may have been the, the name that they had for themselves, and the Greeks transliterated it into Greek. But the word Celtic is actually what this group of people call themselves. And it may have meant something like the tall ones. Um, if, you, if you spend time, uh, you look online, you can read books, you can read scholarly articles, you will find dozens of people who will tell you exactly what the word Celt means. And none of them agree with each other. That there are all these different theories. Ultimately, all we know is that it is the name that applies to this group of people. And on some level, and what does the word Canadian mean? It means you're from Canada. Does it mean anything else? I don't know. Maybe. Um, right? what, 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 is a, what is a Hoosier? It's somebody from Indiana. Does it mean something? I, it might. <laughs> but to me, it means somebody from Indiana. It becomes a name. And so trying to figure out what Celt means is kind of like trying to figure out what Canadian means. It means someone who is Celtic. And now we have used the word in its own definition and it becomes almost meaningless. Right? But so the Celts are here in Gaul. Now Caesar heads into Gaul, into Celtica, and Caesar is going to, uh, I mean, it's kind of hard to talk about it as revenge since it's 200 years later, but he's going to eliminate this threat to the north. And Caesar largely conquers this entire area. Notice this is called Caesar's Gaul in 50. Right? So Caesar has this whole area. Caesar takes over uh, Celtica, and do you know who's not happy about that? The Celts. And so, uh, remember, we, we had this great story of Brennus from 390. He's obviously been gone for a couple centuries. But look how similar this guy looks. His name is Vercingetorix, which is the coolest name in all of history. <laughs> Vercingetorix. Vercingetorix is a Celt or a Gaul. He's, he's both. Um, and uh, in, in around that same time period, um, he is in Gaul, and he organizes a group of his fellow countrymen and says, we don't, we don't need to live under Roman occupation. Let's kick them out. And so Vercingetorix gathers an army, and they, they follow his command. And once again, uh, Caesar, Caesar knows better than to think they're barbarians, but Caesar underestimates them. And at one point, Vercingetorix and his troops outnumber Caesar and surround him. Now, Caesar eventually has some trouble with a guy named Brutus. Um, Brutus, who possibly in a literal sense stabs him in the back. Uh, but Vercingetorix is one of the only people in history who is able to meet Caesar on a battlefield and, and, and make some progress. I mean, Vercingetorix almost defeats Caesar. And if he had, the course of human history would have turned in a much different direction. But he didn't. Even though he had Caesar surrounded and outnumbered, Caesar was a brilliant tactician. He knew who to bribe and when. And Caesar was able to weasel out of it and defeat Vercingetorix. He then had him bound and dragged through the streets of Rome um, by chains. So Vercingetorix, the Celtic warrior, he, he fell. And from that period on, the, the Celts are going to have a very hard time getting any independence or making any headway against Rome in, uh, in Gaul. And so uh, this is Strabo, who is a, a Roman historian. Strabo describes the, the, the empire of Rome, and this is a, an atlas based on his description. You'll notice it's, I don't know what the right word is. I think technically the term is cattywampus. <laughs> <laughs> this map is a little cattywampus. Uh, but as Strabo describes uh, what has happened following Caesar. Because remember, Caesar then, um, well, so right, we get Celtica. So Caesar starts in Rome. He comes up here. He takes over Celtica. And up in here, this area called Britannia, Caesar gets up there. <coughs> Caesar crosses the channel and goes into what we know as Britain. And he takes over a little bit of it when he hears that Brutus is causing trouble in Rome, and he turns around and goes back. So Caesar doesn't get to push too far into Britain, uh, but he does have a little bit. And so this is Rome. It's got a little bit of Great Britain, uh, and they've got this area they still call Celtica. 
Um, now, while all this is happening, there's something very important. Ah, well, actually, yeah, okay, here is, here is Celtic Britain. And so uh, Caesar takes this little bitty sliver, but the Celts, because they've been conquered in France, they start to move even further north. They cross the channel, and so there are Celts all over this island and over here in this place we call Ireland. And so there are Celts all through Britain. They're still trying to fight off the Romans in the south. Um, but while all that's happening, right over here in this little coastal area, there's a group of shepherds who are hard at work in the night shift when suddenly an angel of the Lord appears before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were sore afraid. And so as all of this is happening on the world stage and the Celts are moving into Britain, a group of shepherds see an angel and that brings us to this part of our time. So this is when Jesus is born. By the time Jesus is born, the Celts have been insulted by the Greeks. They have destroyed the Romans and then been destroyed by the Romans, and they've been pushed into uh, what we know as Britain. And Jesus is then born. So um, uh, remember, this is, this is sort of that, that Roman Empire during the New Testament period. And you'll notice, um, as we said, there's a piece of Britain that's part of it, but not all of it. Right? If we look, I think we've got a... Oh, well, we'll do that in a second. Um, up here in the north, there's a part of this island that is still white, and this other island is white. Right? So the, the Romans were only able to take a portion of what we know as the United Kingdom. Then we have the central event in all of history. Right? Uh, Jesus is crucified. Uh, we've looked at this picture. This is Giotto. We've looked at this. It's been years. Uh, but this is... This is, this is situating the Celts in our own history, right? And so let's move a little closer in uh, to this, this map of Rome. Um, up here, Britannia. What is, what is this area called? Scotland. Scotland. The Romans don't get up there. They're, they're down here. Um, over here is Wales. The Romans are kind of over in Wales. Um, and, and in Ireland, there are no Romans. Um, so. Down here is Gaul, right? The, the Romans call it Gallia. This is, this is why we identify Gaul with France, uh, because the Romans call France Gaul. And so from this point forward, when Romans talk about Gauls, they no not longer mean Celts in general. They mean Celts from France. And so this is why the words get so confusing. But so uh, the Romans are now, the, the, the Celts that are here in, in France, they are now subject to Rome, and they start to become Romanized. And they feel the influence of Rome in Latin and Roman theology and philosophy and art and architecture. And to an extent, that happens up here as well. But not up in Scotland and not over in Ireland. The Romans aren't there. While that's all happening, this guy gets to work. Who's this? Where is this picture? It's in our sanctuary. This is our Paul. And so Paul uh, gets to work about this time, right? Jesus has, has died, Jesus has risen, Paul has had his conversion, and what Paul does is he does this. This red line, this is Paul's third missionary journey. This is one of three missionary journeys Paul takes. So that Roman Empire, Paul is busy taking over Rome, right? He's not taking it over politically or to, to redraw national borders. He is going, everywhere this red line goes, Paul tells people about Jesus. And so we find that Christians start to pop up everywhere this red line is. And if you look, I mean, that's, that's a good chunk of the Roman Empire that Paul has covered by himself. Right? This is one person who's covering this much territory in Rome. And so as Paul does that, um, around 116, um, this is what the Roman Empire looks like. So again... Right, think, I mean, Paul is all over here. Um, and if you look at this red line, this is sort of the outer perimeter of the Roman Empire, and look where it is up in Britain. And so there's an emperor named Hadrian, a uh, Roman emperor, who gets up there, and as he looks north of that line, he sees a, a particular group of Celts. At this point, I believe this is the Picts, P-I-C-T, um, who are in a place called Scotland. And Hadrian says, yeah, I don't, I don't want any trouble with that. And so Hadrian builds an enormous wall about right here to keep the Celts from coming back down naked and setting his cities on fire. 
right? So Hadrian built the wall up here to defend the Roman Empire from the Celts, who have now been pushed with the pure sort of uh, Celtic culture all the way to the north in Scotland and in Ireland. <coughs> so this brings us back to our timeline. Um, and we get uh, around the year 300, we get Constantine. So those in between uh, the resurrection of Jesus and Constantine, Paul, everything Paul's doing is not, it's not really encouraged by the government. Right? The Romans aren't real excited about Paul. It's not technically legal to become a Christian until Constantine in the year 312 has this tremendous experience. He sees a sign in the clouds, and this Roman emperor converts and becomes a Christian himself. At this point, that empire now becomes a Christian empire, but things aren't going terribly well, and it eventually gets divided into two. So this is the Western Roman Empire, and you look at Hadrian's Wall up here, keeping those filthy Celts in the north, um, while the good, good Christian Romans are down this direction. So that brings us about to, to 395. All right, that was four, uh, 2,400 years of history in 40 minutes. Before we move to our next little section here, let me breathe. Questions about what we've just covered? OK, it's a lot. All right, so as we get to this point, 300s, Constantine has changed the Roman Empire. It's now if the official religion is, is Christian. And about this period in time, um, somewhere around here, uh, what's left of, of pure Celtic culture continues to evolve. It continues to change. And um, let's see here. We've got, we've got Constantine. And then in the 400s, a very famous Celt is born named Patrick. Now, Patrick, uh, we're going to name one. It's Patrick. Patrick, um, this is a great, a great picture of Patrick from a 1400s uh, book. Uh, Patrick wrote about his own life. We don't have a whole lot of information about Patrick. In the 400s, we're starting to get into what historians consider the Dark Ages. It, it, there are lots of legends about Patrick. History about Patrick is kind of thin. But he did write a little bit about his own life in a, in a book called The Confession of St. Patrick. And so he wrote this. I, Patrick, a most unlearned sinner, the least of all the faithful and the most contemptible amongst many, have had for my father uh, Calphurnius a deacon, who was the son of Pacius, formerly a priest, uh, from the town of Benaven Tabernay, near the village of Enon. He's going to say more, but we can stop. Patrick just told us where he's from. So now we know where Patrick's from. He's from... He's from Benavent. He's just up the road. <laughs> Patrick is from Benavent Tabernay. Anybody know where that is? If you do, you will instantly become famous. Because no one knows where this is. Uh, there are some guesses, right? Some have said, Patrick, what, what country do we associate Patrick with? Ireland. Ireland. Doesn't seem like he was born there. Some have said he was actually born up here which means Patrick is from Scotland. Patrick is Scottish, unless he's not. Uh, because some say he was actually born down here, which means he was probably more in France. So Patrick could have been French, unless he was born up here, which means he's Welsh. So uh, these are the three areas scholars think Patrick may have been born. None of them put him in Ireland. But he continues in the Confessions, and he tells us that he very shortly moved to Ireland. Why did he move to Ireland? Patrick tells us, near the village of Enon, where I was made captive. I was then about 16 years of age, being ignorant of the true God. I was brought captive into Ireland with so many thousand men, according as we had deserved, because we had withdrawn from God and did not keep his command. The Irish kidnapped Patrick. He wasn't born there. Now, Patrick, uh, one of the things we, we, we believe that his father, it says formerly was a priest. Uh, Patrick uh, was born to a, a, they believe a Christian priest. So Cat Patrick had some familiarity with Christianity, but as he explains, didn't exactly follow it. He was then taken into captivity as a slave sold into Ireland. 
And the stories go that when he got there, it wasn't so bad. Um, he was uh, assigned to work as a shepherd. And so Patrick served as a shepherd and grew up in, in Ireland from his teenage years, and he came to love it. Now, stories about Patrick are a lot like stories about Arthur or Robin Hood. There seems to be a historical person, and we know a little bit more about him than we do Arthur or Robin Hood, but there are so many stories about Patrick, they, they literally cannot all be true because they, don't, they, they contradict each other. But there are some really good ones. So just a few moments, let's, let's look at a couple good Patrick stories. So one of the famous Patrick stories is that um, he then went back home to Scotland or France or Wales um, and became a bishop. Uh, he had this conversion experience. He came to love Ireland. He became a bishop. And he loved Ireland so much, he missed Ireland. He went back to preach the gospel to the people who had kidnapped him, who he had grown to love and appreciate. And he stood on a hillside. And as he preached, um, he was attacked by snakes. And these serpents slithered up the hillside to attack Patrick. And he preached. And what happened to the snakes? They left Ireland. So Patrick drove all the snakes out of Ireland. <laughs> and from that point forward, we have no documentation of snakes anywhere in Ireland. Right? Snakes are, are not indigenous to Ireland. So some people have said, well, that means that Patrick must have succeeded. The trick is, before Patrick, we have no indication of snakes anywhere in Ireland since the Ice Age. So saying that Patrick drove the snakes out of Ireland is kind of like saying Michael Hammer <laughs> drove, let's see if this is going to work, the dinosaurs out of Swickley. <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, look, let's be honest, since Michael got here, has anyone seen a dinosaur? <laughs> right? So Michael clearly drove the dinosaurs out of Swickley. Right. So we get this wonderful story about Patrick driving the snakes out of Ireland. Now, some have said it may actually not, these snakes may not have been literal. They may have been a metaphor for, uh, for pagan practices. And we'll talk about that maybe a little bit next week. But there's one great legend of Patrick, another great one. And so as, he, as he's in Ireland, he begins preaching. And he goes to all of these chiefs, all of these kings, um, of different tribes, and he, he tries to explain Christian theology. And at one point, he tries to explain to them the Trinity. And it's really hard to do. Uh, if you've ever tried to explain the Trinity or just sat down and tried to understand the Trinity, it, it, it doesn't make a whole lot of logical sense. And so as Patrick is trying to explain this to a king, um, there are different versions of the legend, but he looks down at his feet, and what's growing but a shamrock? And Patrick then plucks the shamrock, which has three leaves, but is one plant, and says, it's like this. It's three, but it's one. Right? This is the mystery of our faith. Now, as historians look at this, they say, well, it doesn't seem like that's too likely, because there weren't actually a whole lot of shamrocks in Ireland at that point in time. But others have looked and said, there, there may be something even deeper to this story, because in some of the Celtic uh, practices, uh, there are three-leaved plants that were used in some of their religious customs. And so as Patrick is preaching, he may have taken a sacred plant and said, our religions aren't so different. This thing that you hold in esteem, this thing that is so important to you, it's important to me too because it explains the great mystery of our God. And so Patrick then begins to teach and to preach and to proclaim Christian theology. Now, is there any truth to the Shamrock story? No one knows. Boy, it's a really good story. And whether it's a historically accurate story, it does a good job at illustrating what Patrick did. Right? Patrick, he did a lot of teaching, he did a lot of preaching, he did a lot of education, and he tried to tell a people who had raised him, a people that he knew and a people that he loved, about his Christian faith. And so this is uh, how Patrick ends up in Ireland uh, proclaiming the Christian faith. It was already there before him, but he really is um, kind of credited with, with uh, spreading it. Um, and so at this point in time, about 500, this is what um, uh, Britain looks like. And you'll notice uh, the Celtic tribes are the pink, so they're all over the place. Even though it, mostly they've been influenced by Rome, except for in Ireland and Scotland, 
You've got Celts all through Britain. That is going to change. Um, but so as we look at this, then we need to ask ourselves how the people of Ireland responded to Patrick and how this Celtic culture expressed Christianity. Right? This culture that we, we found, we can date back, they, they had inscriptions from 600 BC. So uh, out of here, a thousand years, how are they going to express this new Christianity? And what did these centuries of art and custom look like as they expressed the new theology? And I'm going to suggest to you there is a concrete link between Swickley Presbyterian Church and Celtic culture. And I will tell you all of that <laughs> next week. Uh, so it is 1050. Um, I got a hustle to get up to church. Uh, so <laughs> let's, let's go. Uh, Lord, we give you thanks for the chance to spend this time together, uh, for the chance to see not only what's happening in Scripture, but what's happening in the rest of the world and how it connects to our own heritage. Uh, we ask that you'll bless us as we go from this place and that you'll help us to see our story as a part of your story. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much.